So I just read over your your description. Uh, so what I'll have you do actually is pull Frank in towards you. And uh, with your, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull towards this way to bring Frank facing this way. Yep. And then with your right hand, you're gonna choke up here. You're gonna press down the hind quarters with your left hand. Like that. Correct. So every time Frank gets up, you're just gonna repeat that process so that he sits still, okay? And I'll explain why in a little bit. If he lays down, it's fine, but just keep your leash like that, okay? Um, so Frank, human and dog reactive. Uh, I think you guys described fear and nervous face behavior. He did a two week uh, stay, which you added training or was it a board and train when he was six months? Training, was... Okay, was it food based or? Um, she said it was like yeah, it was, alpha training. Yeah, alpha training, like what she said. Okay, so the old school? So. Did they show you what they did? No. no? Really? Well, yeah. she, came well she came over and like tried to show us like the alpha behavior, but it, it, it definitely would seem to be more fear based. Like, it was like no, no vocal like, A lot of cues. stomping. Yeah. Like stomping if he gets on the counter, if he does anything bad, like kind of like kick him away like with your knee. Sure. And, like keep your eyes up. She always said like don't look in the eyes. Okay. Um, how did he respond when she tried to do it? He, she listened to him, or he listened to her, but uh -huh. it was, he was kind of always, he came back just like a nervous wreck all the time. Okay. Like, I don't know if it was the timing of like how old he was, because he was only six months when he Sure. Was, but it was really, from then on, like he was just, he's always had like just very nervous all the time. Okay, so you, do you think prior to that he was fine, or or do you think like you're seeing signs of it? And it... We didn't see aggressive signs, like he didn't, we could take it like, we could take him on walks and he wasn't aggressive to people or dogs. Okay. He came back and he was ultra aggressive to people and dogs. Okay. Uh, a couple things may have happened. One, um, there's two pivotal time frames in a dog's life where there's personality shifts, six months in a year. Okay. Okay. Almost always um, when a client comes to me, they're like, hey, Jesse, you know, my dog was completely fine with dogs. And then at six months, we were at the dog park and a dog attacked my dog. And since that day, my dog's been aggressive towards dogs. Or like I had a lady, um, a shelf of pans fell uh, when the dog was like a year, right? And ever since that shelf of pans, the dog was kind of like this, just like nervous wreck, you know? And the owner is like, well, this sucks because it was literally like a catalyst, right? And then the next day, all of a sudden I get a different dog. For, for your dog, potentially, um, the approach that, we u that was used um, if it was done incorrectly or um, overdone. Yeah. Um, because dogs are physical animals, they do this to them to each other. So I'm not against like the theory of alpha training or anything like that, but it does have to be done a certain way. Yeah. People's um, notion of dominance training or dominance theory training is usually over assertion. Okay, whereas for another dog, they would assert themselves and in the moment the dog gives them what they want, like right here, you see how you keep putting your hand down? But as soon as Frank lays down or sits, what do you do? Uh, yeah, you leave him alone, you relax, yeah. right? So that's a conversation, because Frank's like, I want to do something, and you're saying you can't do that, you have to do this, right? That's technically what we'd call like a dominance type conversation, because the dog wants to do one thing and you're saying, no, you got to do another thing, right? So dominance, or, or in my opinion, dominance theory, is there always has to be an energy that's in control, right? So growing up, I'm, a, I'm the oldest of four kids, uh, you know, I had mom and dad. Mom and dad were the leaders of the household, right? They made the rules. Um, if they left, I would technically be the dominant energy because I was the oldest of the four. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I could reinforce rules to a degree, but I couldn't do certain consequences because that was saved solely for my parents. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for dogs, they live in that world constantly. So if you're not asserting yourself, they'll assert themselves for you. So there always has to be somebody in control, okay? But the problem is, uh, people do it incorrectly a lot of the time. You guys familiar with Caesar Milan? Yeah. The dog whisperer? Yeah. So he's a great example of someone who does it correctly. Because if you watch him and he asserts himself, like, it'll tell you time frames where it's like 30 minutes later, right? And he's sitting there standing at the dog, you know? <laughs> but, what pe but people don't see that. Yeah. People just see like, wow, he like just like postured the dog and like corrected them and they just did it. And they're like, no, like there was literally a 15 minute uh, uh, sign there that lets you know he waited for 15 minutes until the dog gave him what he wanted. So there's actually a lot of patience in it when he's asserting himself, right? Yeah. Dogs are very much similar, except dogs, if they reinforce, will nip and bite. 
but they do so, most dogs do so correctly. Yeah. Okay, every now and then we get a dog that has like what I call anger management issues and they overcorrect or they're more so like aggressive, yeah. right? So just like with humans, uh, most people, like we get angry, right? There's things that upset us throughout life, um, but most people will get upset and would escalate maybe to physicality, right? Whereas there's some people that just escalate to physicality. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the same thing for dogs as well. So whatever it is that caused this to happen with Frank, I was supposed to tell people like, don't worry about it. It is what it is. We're here now because Frank's not going back and thinking to that moment, you know, and reflecting like, man, yeah. like ever since that day, right? He's just living his life. And what happens is if there's something that puts him under stress, he's going to trigger. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Questions about any of that stuff? No. So what are your goals? Uh, what are you wanting to do here with Frank? So we really want to get to the point where when we take him outside, when we, we just want to be able to, walk basically him. if we walk him outside, everything triggers him. Sure. It's going to be a person, it's going to be a dog, it's going to be a bag that goes by. Sure. Like he's, he's, he can't get comfortable to the point where, like occasionally he'll get like this where he's, he's okay and things are going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but this is pretty much the behavior. And then rotate, good. Yep. Good. Like that. Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, anything else? That's really it. Because when we're at home and it's just us, and he's he's a sweet dog. He's good. He's well behaved. He doesn't do anything bad. Mm -hmm. um, but it it's even things that happen outside if he's looking outside. Sure. Turn around. Correct. Yeah. yeah so you want to rotate. Five. There you go. <laughs> he sees that dog over there. There you go. Good job. Um, how about when people come over? How is he? He's reactive. He'll bark if anyone walks in. Mm -hmm. And then if he starts to recognize them, like my mom, who he, he's known since he was a baby, mm -hmm. like he'll chill out. But okay. he then he'll start to power sometimes with like children that come in, like I my see. nieces and nephews. Uh -huh. He powers. Um, but yeah, his first approach is to bark, 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 snarl a little bit, and then he just kind of powers. I gotcha. And is this for anybody that comes in? Yeah. Even new people he's never met before? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, new people are he's new people ultra aggressive. More aggressive. Like those are the ones okay. That he barks at the most. Okay. But does he cower away or does he uh, hold his ground? Does he move forward? He'll move forward sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Is this all on leash? No, sometimes it will be off leash too. Okay. So how do you handle it? Uh, do you like not have people come over then? Yeah. Or? Yeah, well, we don't really have a lot of people over and especially with COVID. So he, and like we, last month we brought him with us to, we were, they, yeah, we were in the family yep. house we, where there was a lot of people and he had, we ended up having to keep them in the room the whole time because this was him the whole time. Sure. He was, and he would be aggressive with everybody that, and skate, like, but it was, he wasn't really moving forward. It was like kind of backwards, and then he did nip a couple of times, which was the first okay. time we've seen that. Air nip or nip at the. Nip at their legs. Okay. But then it made contact or like made no. subtle, subtle contact. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, anything else? No, that's really that's pretty much it. Uh, did you guys do research on how we train the methods that we use? Yeah, I I found you online, and then the guy that I work with actually used you. Oh, so who his you name with? is Jeremy. Uh, Sorry. It might be uh, a border collie. Okay. They, I think he did class. Oh, before. is it a brown collie? I think so. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I remember. He, he and I were talking, and he said that he, re he highly recommended coming to you. Yeah, because I think their dog was reactive as well. Yeah, yeah. he was. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I think uh, Bentley or something is yeah. maybe the dog's name. I think it is. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So we use e collar or prong collar or both. Okay. Uh, primarily e collar. Prong collar we incorporate if needed. So like I had a client uh, who was like maybe 90, 100 pounds, young lady, uh, 150 pound Great Dane, okay, <laughs> who was dog reactive. And she lived in Bucktown. So dogs were like everywhere, right? Yeah. So she could see, turn a corner and see a dog. Dog would drag her across the street. So we did prong and e-collar because she needed as much leverage as possible to compensate for that size difference, right. okay? So the prong is there like just in case if she turned the corner and there was a dog, she had the immediacy because it's uh, the, the way it's fitted, if it's fitted correctly, you can, uh, uh, contain the dog, whereas the e-collar would be what would actually shut the dog's reactivity down, okay? Uh, so she used both. Both Mo In most cases, it's just remote collar, okay? Are you guys familiar with what an e-collar is? Yeah. Yes. We actually bought one, like, a year ago. I just never really knew how to use it. 
Do you remember how uh, what it looked like? Um, it's the dog truck. One. Okay. Do you do you know what the model is? Um, no. Okay. Do you still have it? <laughs> yeah, we do. It's in the car too. We didn't bring it with us, but that's fine. Do you remember how much you paid for it? It was like two seventy or two fifty. So you probably got the twenty three hundred. I'm gonna say. Yeah, I can look it up right yeah. now. Yeah. Go ahead. Because um, uh, that's very important. Because if you have the correct collar, good. Um, the main thing with e collars is that it has to be appropriate to your dog's size. Uh, a lot of times people just look online and they go like, oh, this has good ratings and they just buy whatever. Sure. So like I had clients that have like a 90 pound dog and the collar's meant for a 35 pound dog. So I was like, yeah, we can't use that. That's, there's too much of a size difference there, okay? Uh, especially in the case like this because your dog has thicker fur or longer fur. Um, your dog is a nervous, um, fear-based reactive dog. So we also want to think about when the dog's in stress, the size of your dog, right? All these things kind of factor in and we want to make sure we have enough output to cut through all that in order to like tell the dog, everything is fine okay um now when you got the e collar yep up yep up good excellent um was it just like off of your own like just you guys were thinking like, well, this is what we haven't tried or um well so i had a dog that i used it on a long time ago my okay. my oldest dog sure he, uh, he was trained on an e-collar and he, it was he was it was fantastic okay it worked great for him excellent um but by the time like so for the first eight years of his life we had it and then i never even had to use it anymore after sure he lived to 16 from the rest of his life he was just he was just the most well-behaved good dog ever good so e-collar uh i'm sorry how long ago was that when you uh so I haven't used it in probably 10 years. 10 years, okay. Uh, I was just checking because- um, Maybe longer. From ten, longer. 10 years ago, the technology was where it's at now, but before that, uh, e-collars only had like three to five levels, okay. whereas like the Doctor one has like 127, yeah. depending on the model that you less, bought. Less, less, it was way less, it wasn't 120. The one that you had? Yeah, the one that I had. Okay, yeah. It was so, more like a five. Yes. So. Um, the issue with those with the five levels is that if the dog is yelping at three but then at two they're not listening you're kind of stuck sure. with the dog just yelping at three right otherwise if you're using two and they're not listening well that just kind of goes against the whole theory of doing the e-collar sure. yeah. whereas now with the collars that we use they have 127 levels we can fine tune it between 60 to 40 to 50 to 51 to 49 to what the dog needs in that particular moment yep. okay um did you find it yeah and then it's brought me to another window <laughs> oh it's okay um, so I found it It was the, this one, the 1900S. Okay, sure. Yeah, I know something. Okay. okay. So that's a good collar. Okay. Did you ever use it on him? I uh, did, yeah. Very, like very, very limited. limited. Um, very low setting. We, we did like the tapping. It uh -huh. was like a seven out of the hundred something. Okay. And did like the tap to get a treat and then like to come to me. It did like tap, tap, tap until it came and then stopped it. Okay. That's like all we really did. Okay. And then the buzzer on it. If the he vibration? Was barking, yeah, the vibration we did if he was barking. Okay. But that was it. Okay. That so was the 1900 S is a good model. The issue that we've seen with it yeah. is so that's actually one that's meant for a 35 pound dog and under. Got it. Okay. okay. Um, now, let's say he's responding at the seven for the training, right? Yeah. But that's like probably like an empty yard or something. Yeah. Whereas we want to be out here. Okay. okay. So the issue that we have with the 1900 S is the way that it's being delivered. Uh, in my opinion, or my theory, it's it's sharper than most collars. Okay? okay. So the dog's reaction to it tends to be more um, abrasive. You know. Okay. Uh, I have like ten of those in my facility because you can. It's interesting because we'll do training with it, like a boarding train, and the dog's like yelping at everything, right? And then we switch them to a completely different model. Same, it's Doctra, but okay. different model. Dog is doing fine. You know, so once you've seen that and you've seen it repeatedly, it's like, okay, there's, it's a good collar, but there's something wrong with it because most dogs don't do well with it, yeah. okay? I'm not opposed to using it to see how it works for him in the beginning. Okay. The only thing that I will say is if you move forward with the training, we use that collar and we get to the third class and it's like we're having these issues, it's most likely because of the collar, okay? okay? So then I would say upgrade your collar. I'd give you the correct model that he should be on, okay. but then we may have lost like two yeah. classes does that make sense yeah, yeah. so uh, i'll leave that up to you guys um gotcha sure um otherwise i mean it is a good brand it's a good collar but that particular model for whatever reason uh yeah. we've noticed those issues okay, okay. so um 
When, so what you're doing is conditioning, right? Tap means come to me and you get a reward. When we're doing, with our theory of training, it's a, it's a bit different. Okay. Uh, I come at it like dogs, in a way. Dogs don't ease each other into life, okay? It's just, here's life. So like, if there's a mother dog with like a litter of puppies, and uh, at about three to four weeks, if the puppy like starts to annoy the mom, they just nip and bite the puppy. Right, and then the puppy will walk away like yelping and all that stuff, and the human goes, "Oh my God!" Right, and then it's like, "No, like that's just how they treat each other." Right, uh, but that's super important because that's actually how they toughen up their puppies. Okay, because most people, when they get the puppies at two months, right, or eight weeks, they don't do any kind of physicality to correct their puppies. So their puppies go from getting structured physicality within their litter and their mother to do whatever you want, and there's no consequence. At least no consequence that they understand. Because we tend to do spray bottle, uh, put them in timeout in the kennel turn around, yelp, right, or whatever, or, or ignore the dog, um, which dogs don't do to each other. If, if a dog's being annoyed, they just bite the puppy, you know, and they, they will ignore as well. But the thing is, if they ignore and the puppy just keeps pushing, they just bite the puppy, you know, and that's the key thing that people miss. So the puppy goes from receiving all that and then they go to a home with the human where we don't do that. And that's where issues start to happen. Okay, because physicality helps toughen them up. Okay, when done correctly, right, because with the, uh, your trainer earlier, I don't know, I can't give my opinion on that. Yeah. And it, cause it, and I'm not saying it's just, I'm like, it could have been just something else. It could have been you guys leaving them for two weeks for the first time at six months. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's traumatic for some dogs. So it's Cause they go from like, if you had them from two months, yeah. the first four months, you're his everything. You're his 24 seven, you're his 365, right? Yeah. And then it's like, all right, but we're leaving. And he's like, like that itself, it's like kids dropping off for the first day of school. Yeah. You know, we're like, mom, <laughs> dad, right? Yeah. yeah, it's the same thing for dogs. So it could have also just been that, yeah. you know? Right. Um, and that's why I said, don't worry about it because you can think and theorize all you want and it's not gonna help us now, okay? okay? So I get this kind of case all the time. So this is definitely nervous reactivity. So fear, nervousness, and uh, anxiety look similar, but they have defining features. Nervousness um, will settle, but then if there's a sudden change in the environment, they'll trigger right because he settles then that kid came by he started barking right he settled and then a dog barked over there earlier he started barking right so everything's fine now but as soon as you add in the shift in the environment trigger right that's classic nervous dog fear-based energy um will trigger and like doesn't shut up okay and they want to keep away so like if he was fear-based towards me he would keep growling and lunging right but he'd want to keep back and he's only lunging trying to act tough, but the moment I move in, he would move back, because yeah. he really doesn't want anything with me. He's just trying to act tough, mm -hmm. okay? So fear-based energy usually keeps away and it just keeps at it. Um, anxious energy will not relax. It'll keep moving around, okay? And they're panting, they're salivating, their eyes are really big, right? They're shaking, they're moving all over the place. That's typical anxious energy. So here he's settled, but he might trigger with this puppy coming up, because now there's gonna be a sudden shift in the, in the environment, right? So right now, with what we're doing, because on the harness, harness uh, provokes more reactivity, okay? It can double or triple a dog's behavior. So if a dog is, yep, bring him in, yep, up, and then down on the hindquarters. Very good, just like that. Good, up again, and then relax, like that. That's fine. Um, and then bring in a little bit. So, yep, like that, just towards you like that that's good um so harnesses um uh, create what's called opposition reflex i guess you're familiar with that it's when a dog feels pressure they want to go against it so when you pull him can you see him pulling away uh, sometimes yeah, yeah you can feel it a little bit yeah. that's opposition reflex okay so right now because of you have the collar fit on his neck you guys ever been on the boat yeah yep so boats their power is forward and backwards but if the wind is pushing it'll drift the boat they really don't have any kind of side power Okay, does that make sense? Dogs are the same way. So since you have the collar up here and uh, it's the top of his body, you can easily rotate him like this and turn him away from whatever it is that's triggering him, triggering him right? So earlier you grabbed his butt and his head and you went like this and you just whoop, shifted him like that, right? Because he's got no power going this way. His power is all like this, okay? So with the harness, plus it's on the chest, if a dog pulls forward and pushes forward with the hind legs, all the power is on the chest now, right? So not only does it put in, give him more leverage because where the harness is placed, it's exacerbating the tension that he's feeling, which is causing him to be more reactive, okay? So that's opposition reflex, is when a dog feels pressure, yep, and then rotate. 
Good. Good. You got it. You got it. Yep, take the time. Like that, and then relax. Um, yep. Bring them in. There you go. Yep. There you go. Like that. Um, when he feels pressure against the chest, it triggers that opposition reflex, which creates more frustration. So when we train dogs to be like protection dogs, which is like the canine type dogs, yeah. guess what we put on the dog? Pardon? Yes. Because we want nothing inhibiting the throat. We want to create frustration. We want to hold the dog back, like kind of like, let me at him, let me at him. Right? And then we praise it good. Right? And then we want to reward it. We release. Okay. Now the dog charges. Right? And then we develop it from there. Yes. Oh so, and you'll read a lot of BS on the internet where it's like, harnesses doesn't make dog aggressive, blah, blah, blah. We yeah. literally use it in protection training. Yes, wow. okay. Uh, unless your dog is gonna pull a sled like a husky or, or do some kind of pulling behavior, right? Yeah. Harnesses are not meant for walking. Okay? Okay. Even the no pull harnesses with the front clip thing, yeah. that's an oxymoron, right? Because harness, harnesses are meant for pulling. Right. So it, all it does is deviate the pulling pressure so that it rotates the dog's front legs, okay? But the dog is still going against, they're still trying to pull. But yeah. they call it a no pull harness because the dog just cannot put its full power okay. into it. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. yeah. I almost got one of those too because I just feel, I felt bad with the thing on his neck because he doesn't yeah. pull so much. The trachea, yeah. correct. And that's what training is for, yeah. right? And like for now, you can continue to walk him on the harness uh, to avoid the yeah. whole trachea thing. Yeah. But right now it's standing. This is your easiest thing because you're not in motion. Yeah. It's just, hey, bud, we're sitting here, just chill out, yeah. okay? And what, I, what I'm having you do here is simply a means of de-escalation. Uh, it's a band-aid fix, just so that we can have a conversation and he's not just sitting there the entire time like this, yeah. okay? Is that all making sense? Yeah. Cool. Uh, questions about any of that stuff? No. So when it comes to the e-collar, most people, when they think about either doing it themselves or they think about how we're gonna apply it, they usually think that we're gonna go make the dog be a bad dog and then just punish the behavior, yeah. okay? Uh, your dog's behavior is coming from somewhere, right? Yeah. Where is that behavior coming from? And what else? Uh, anxiety and stress. Or what was the three? Stress is it, right? Stress. Nervousness. A nervousness. Yeah, so yeah. your dog is primarily a nervous dog. Yeah. Okay, that, that, him, he's nervous, he's nervous with a little bit of fear. I don't really pick up much anxiety here. Okay. Okay. So, his reactivity, technically speaking, <coughs> yep. <coughs> is not the problem. Okay. It's the outcome or the symptom of a problem, which is his nervousness. Does that make sense? So out here, like when we see these people walking their dogs and stuff, we're just yeah. like, these are people enjoying Oz Park, right? It's yeah. a beautiful day. For him, because he's nervous and he's on leash, he's under stress and he may perceive them as threats. Okay. okay? So if we, if, if we feel something is a threat, we go under stress, yeah. right? Stress response for him is nervousness. So then he goes, well, I'm gonna handle this with reactivity to keep that away, yeah. right? Now I read that he goes to daycare and he's good, but you have to be careful when he's on leash, entering, exiting, right? right. Yeah. So we have, so we have nervousness, fear, anxiety, and aggression, right? And then we have um, a, a kind of like a, another subset of behaviors that are stress-related. Uh, fight or flight are the two that most people have heard of, right? Mm -hmm. We have fight or flight, then we have avoidance and submission. Okay. okay. The key two of the first two are almost always going to be fight or flight. When your dog is on a leash, which one is removed? Well, he, he does not flee. He's, he can't flee, yeah. right? So what does that leave? Fight reactivity yep. right because people are like why is my dog becoming reactive I'm like well the first two always fight or flight yeah. right so if your dog can't run from it because he's tethered to you that's gonna leave fight response mm -hmm. reactivity would be categorized under fight response because he's saying hey keep away from me I'm a bad dog you don't want none of this mm -hmm. okay he's trying to bluff him away does that make sense yeah. so when we work with the reactivity stuff the first thing you always want to do is see what what the structure and discipline fix okay. okay so dog discipline is nipping and biting think of your e-collar as a bite on the button okay, okay. you're nipping and biting your dog but we're not coming out, like we wouldn't be here sitting here and like, all right, tap the collar when he barks, right? We have to teach him what it is. We have to teach him the conversation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we always teach is heel, which is leash walking, okay? Yeah. Did you guys watch any of our training videos? I watched some of them. Okay, did you watch the one? There was another Pyrenees, the dog's name is Birdie. I did not. Know. That's a good one for you guys to watch. Okay. Very much the same dog, okay? So the dog's name is Birdie, um, and it's like a 10 to 15 minute video or whatever, and you see, exactly the same behavior and then you see the shift and then you see like within the week one class to the next where they're like holy shit we took our dog to a farmer's market dog was fine oh okay? okay and it, all it was was discipline okay. 
and, and teaching the dog how to walk correctly. Yeah. Okay, and this was a dog that had several trainers. Uh, this couple came from Austin, Texas. They had a, they have a place here and they have a place in Austin, so they're trying to find one an answer and then two a place they could bring their dog yeah. because no one could board the dog either. So I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, once your dog is trained and stuff, it's not a problem. Right. So, uh, but that's a very good uh, video to watch. So, when we do the healing exercise, which is leash walking, right? Reactivity is a leash behavior, right? It's on leash, the dog is reactive. Is we want to see what does the heel behavior fix and it's not the obedience okay that's helping your dog it's the discipline yeah. it's the fact that your dog is being being given consequence for not holding up the standards now yeah. so if the dog is not here and i want a completely slack leash with the dog at my side right shoulder parallel to my left leg right and i don't care what the environment is when you have that level of focus and discipline a lot of times all the other stuff just starts to disappear okay because okay? now the dog's thinking i need to stress out more about you than i do about the environment because when I, when I do something that is um, out of what your expectation is, there is a physical consequence that is real. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for the dog, if Frank sees um, another dog, he goes under stress. Mm -hmm. But that's like emotional, that's um, in the head, right? Perceiving threat, but there's never been like a concrete experience, mm -hmm. right? But for you, if he gets out of line and you remote him and you correct him and he feels it, that is now concrete. So now he has to think, what am I more worried about? The concrete correction or this dog that's gonna pass by that we've never had an experience with, yeah. right? So now the brain has to do math. So we're overriding one stressor with another stressor, theoretically speaking, okay? But what it ends up happening is the dog goes, well, I wanna avoid this, right? So I'm not gonna deviate, I'm not gonna become reactive. Then the dog passes, and then Frank realizes, hey, I wasn't reactive, nothing happened with that dog, nothing happened with the collar, everything was fine. So then he starts to realize, oh, I don't have to be on this edge of assuming everything's a threat. Does that make sense? Yeah. For us, people are always like, well, how does this work when you're using a negative to like fix another bee? I was like, because like we think differently than dogs, right? It's hard for people to understand that a thing that's a negative or a punisher or whatever, an aversive, would get a dog to actually build more confidence handling the world. I'm like, because dogs are physical animals, they bite each other. Yeah. They don't talk to each other and like say, hey bud, you can do it. Like that's, that's not a thing, okay? Yeah. So when, with the e-collar, it's the closest means that we have to communicate to the dog as another dog at the press of a button, okay? It's very, and he could be on or off leash. Doesn't matter, right? If he's off leash and he decides to a bark, yep. Yep, good. We have a means of correcting him up to a mile away, pending the model that you get. Okay. Okay, and most people obviously wouldn't have their dog a mile away from them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, is that all making sense? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So the first thing we always cover is the heel. Okay, heel is typically two classes. Okay. So we have the first class. Like, so how I'm coaching you here is similar to how we do our training. I don't need to touch your dog. You just show up with your dog, your equipment, everything, and I walk you through everything. It's all hands-on for you, okay? So people like it, and we're usually here training, depending the weather, right? So my client after you has a nervous reactive German Shepherd, okay. um, and then we trained here, and then already within the week, he's seeing great progress. Right, okay. because you're in the midst, and this is not even busy for Oz Park, like this is pretty slow. It yeah. gets yeah. crazy busy yeah. here, okay? So clients like, because they're like, they're in the middle of, yeah. of you know, Everything. busyness in life, and they're getting the results, so when they go home, it's much more easier to transfer, yeah. okay? Whereas most training is like done in a closed off room and stuff, yeah. um, and it's unrealistic. Clients aren't a big fan of that, because like, well then how do I know how to transfer this in the real world, right? right. So we coach through all that stuff. So this way, during the week, you would apply everything that you learned, and then we see what progress does Frank make, right? So when you come back, you're like, hey, Jesse, 80% of that reactivity is gone. Yeah. I go, great. When was he reactive? You're like, well, a dog came like three feet away from him. I'm like, oh, that's really close. That's why he was reactive, yeah. right? So we have proximity. So, I, so then I ask you questions to figure out where are we still having residual reactivity? Yeah. And then we make some tweaks. We work on the second part of heel. And then you repeat the process. You come back class three and we just keep kind of building on that, okay? okay? Now. Uh, when it comes to length of time and cost and everything, it just comes down to how much you're wanting to achieve with Frank, okay? Mm -hmm. Is it just, we want to address his reactivity and have people come over, uh, or you want to have to be able, uh, you want to be able to have him off leash and like trust that he's going to return to you? Like all that adds more to the plate, okay? okay? Questions on any of that? No. Um, so that's what I was asking earlier, like what's your go what, what are your yeah. goals? So obviously walking him. Yep. Yeah. I would assume you'd like to have people over. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> we want to be able to like, also like, bring him kind of everywhere we go. Like, like to we... people's houses. Okay. Okay. So 
Uh, we have six, nine, and 12 class programs, technically three, six, nine, but you're in the six, nine, 12 range, okay? okay. Six is bare minimum, 12 is if you want a fully trained dog, okay? okay? Variable always being the behavior, okay? Uh, obedience is easy. Obedience, I know what I can get done within a time frame, but with behavior, it comes down to how, how much are you able to repeat the process? Um, did you follow through 100%? Were you able to follow through? You know, because sometimes it just happens like this. You don't have the opportunity to 100% address the issue, right? Yeah. So all those things factor in. Uh, so if you do a six class pro program, that's what I call the bare bones. Okay. Um, that's where um, I give you only the essentials, right? Everything that I know that you would need. So heal, it's two classes. By the third class, we will have a good handle on what the reactivity is like, okay? If we're still struggling with any bit of reactivity, um, the third class will most likely be dedicated to like, okay, here's how we can address the reactivity, okay? okay. Uh, by the fourth class, if we feel like we have a handle on things and we're making progress, we just keep tabs on the reactivity. Because once you understand how to address it, it's just rinse and repeat, okay? okay? Uh, so by the fourth class, we could be jumping into people coming over. That would be an in-home. Uh, the fifth class would most likely, uh, recall is very important in case your dog ever gets off leash, so I would probably suggest recall. Or stationary control, which is like go to this bed and don't move, which is also part of having people come over. It yeah. just gives you an option, okay? okay? The sixth class I look at as a variable. So it's like, okay, we made great progress one through five, we got a good handle on things, let's cover that other behavior that we didn't get a chance to cover, okay? Like the recall or whatever, or the, the stationary work, depending on what you pick. Uh, or it's like, hey, you know, we had someone come over and it didn't go as smoothly. Can you come over and we have someone come over, okay. right? So then we do another in-home. So you kind of pick yeah. and choose. Okay. But with the leash walking exercise and covering the reactivity, I know you walking your dog should not be an issue, okay? okay? Pending you're doing all the homework as you're supposed to, yeah. okay? The nine week program gives us a nice buffer. We have three more classes, okay? So with, with nine classes, I'm, I'm fairly confident we can cover recall, stationary work, uh, walking on a leash, reactivity, um, and the nervous behavior and people coming over type stuff within nine classes, okay? okay? 12 classes would be, we want everything. We want to address the behaviors and we want as close to an off-leash trained dog as possible, okay? So there's six commands, sit, stay, down, come, play, seal. All those commands can be built to an off-leash level. It's just whether or not the owner is gonna use it and the owner wants it, okay? okay. The key three are always heal, walking your dog on the leash, mm -hmm. recall, get your ass over here, yeah. and place, which is don't move. Okay, so those three commands will allow you to do a lot of things with your dog. Sit, down, and stay are kind of superficial. Um, they're more strict, right? Whereas, so if I told the dog to down, that would be a down, right? He cannot budge from that position. If I tell the dog place, he goes to a bed, but he can sit, stand, or lay down. I don't care, just don't get off. So it's easier, but they do the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why most people like to practice that because it's easier for them because Having to reinforce this to that degree where the dog has to constantly be laying down yeah. is more work, okay? okay? So if you did 12, I go, okay, cool. I have 12 classes with you. That also changes how I lay out the program, okay? Because I'm, I'm seeing you want the whole nine yards. So, so I think we want to do the 12 because yeah. you know, right now we're staying in a small apartment where we, we're building a house. And the house, we're gonna have a big yard and we want him to be able to out in the yard. We're sure. going to have a gate and everything, but if we, we want to be able to have control from a distance. Sure. The, the yard is, is, is pretty big. Okay. So with the 12, um, the first six classes would end up being all the obedience stuff, heal, um, uh, um, recall, stay, all that stuff. We'll still do behavior. We'll still do the reactivity, right? But I knocked that out the first six classes so that we use the next six classes to build to an off-leash level. Okay. Okay. okay, so that's the big thing. Because people ask, well, can I do six and then another six? I go, you can, but the layout is different. Yeah. Okay, because I go, okay, you're doing six, so I got to bare bones it. Right. So the approach is completely opposite of like the 12 class. Yeah. So that's good to know. Yeah. And you can think about it, mull it over, talk to Maria. Um, but it would be the first six, we still work on reactivity, but I want to cover all the obedience stuff first. And then the next six, uh, we start pushing to an off-leash level, and we can still do all the other stuff too, okay, like the behavioral stuff. Now, typically, by class nine, if you guys are at right, think you're at right, like, okay, behavior's making great progress, uh, your, your obedience training's doing really well, is classes 10, 11, and 12, we most likely will space out, okay? okay? At least a month to a couple of months. Because to build to off-leash, you need to rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, okay? okay. To get off-leash training, you have to go outside and actively train your dog outside in the open area, okay? okay. The, uh, 
The, all the on-leash stuff is easy because it's on a short leash. So anytime you walk your dog, anytime that you're in the yard, right, anytime you're in the house, you can practice all this stuff. Oh, okay. Off-leash training requires you to go out yeah. and actively practice the stuff to build to that level, okay? So if I see you week by week, what I've come to learn is that life happens, weather happens, right? You get busy, you get sick. It's like, oh, Jesse, we only had one chance to practice with the dog this week. So I'm like, well, why are we here, yeah. right? It's really just a waste of your time and money, right? Yeah. So I tell people, once we hit the, once I feel like you're at the right point, I'll say, okay, space out your classes, okay? Now I get some clients that say, Jesse, I want to see you every week still. I go, that's fine. We'll keep seeing each other. But I'm just letting you know that you're not going to end where you would if you, if you, as if you spaced them out. Okay? okay, so spacing them out allows you to push the behavior more, making sure that we're seeing consistency, uh, push the obedience. So then when you come back a month or two months later, or whatever, you're like, hey, Jesse, everything's great, but we struggle with this, or Frank sucks at this, right? Oh, well, cool, show me what you're doing. All right, let's fix that. Here's what we do. Go off and practice for another month or whatever, and then okay. you come back when you're ready. And then typically by that 12th class, the dog is actually already off these trained, but the owner just wants to be supervised yeah. <laughs> while they are using everything, right? So now I'm just there to kind of give notes on stuff, and then uh, at, at that point, they typically have the confidence, okay? Now, everybody, everybody is different. Uh, I've had clients where the dogs were great, but the client wasn't ready. You know, like I've had clients whose dogs were reactive, and their dog makes phenomenal progress, right? But the, the owner's like traumatized, right? So they're like, Jesse, I would never trust this dog, you know, this and that. And then months later, their dog is off leash, you know, because it took them longer to catch up to the dog. And in some cases, the owner is like ready right away, but the dog is not ready. You know, so I point out to them like, no, you need more progress, you need more time and practice, whatever, to get your dog to that same level, okay? So, um, it's, um, it's flexible. Um, in our contract that Maria would send to you, you'll read that it's like week by week, whatever. Yeah. Exceptions are if I talk to you and say like, hey, this is what we should do now. And even with my behavior cases, because uh, I care about getting that result, even if an owner is doing six classes and they're like struggling with something, I'll tell them, don't come back for class four until we get this fixed, okay. right? So then they'll shoot me emails and I'll email them what to do. And if they're still struggling, then I'll go, okay, let's go and have that class now. You know, so this way they get the most out of those six classes. Okay. Um, question on any of that stuff? No. Where would you suggest training him if when we get to that point, it's down the road, I know, but off leash, like... What's your neighborhood? So we actually just moved to the suburbs. Okay. You. Um, What's the trek? Yeah. <laughs> Should have been training I before. Oh, dude. Yeah, he's downtown work, so. every day. So. Gotcha. Um, so, uh, Lakefront's great okay. if you're going to be in the city because yeah. it's miles of open space. Okay. Grant Park is great. Same thing, miles of open space. Okay. Oz Park is great when you're ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> it gets busy. Like, it's, it's we, crazy. We used to live right here. Yeah, we we were, for six park. months, we brought him here all the time. Gotcha. Yeah. Sure. So. Palmer Square is off the expressway. Okay. So, if you're coming off the expressway, it's, uh, it's a pretty sizable park. It can be fairly busy. But it's in Logan Square. So that's another place to practice. A super big dog park. There, is it can be done at a dog park? Or yeah, if you're not worried about his behavior off leash, off like leash, we bring him to the dog park and he has fun and he's great. Yeah, then it's, you're then you're perfectly fine. He has no issue with the dogs. Yeah, or people that even have fun. Yeah. Right? So, going back to earlier, right? Because on leash he's reactive. Yeah. yeah. And then you take the leash off in, he's fine. Like we have yeah. to, like we have to like time it to bring him into the dog park where like no one's coming in, and sure. I want to get him off his leash as quickly as possible. Yep. As soon as I get him off his leash, he runs and just starts playing and and has a great time. Why do you think he's social off leash but not on leash? I don't know. The restriction probably yeah, because he can run now, yeah. right? If there's danger, he can actually flee it now. Yeah. You know, because people are like Jesse, why is my dog reactive on leash but off leash they're social? Yeah. And I'm like, that's why because on leash you're removing that flight response, right? Yeah. So when you remove that leash, now you can run if needed. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, I know it's, 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 it's weird, right? Dogs um, are what I call on or off. So like, if I know I have a dog that's a resource guarder, I'm not worried about that dog biting me unless there's a uh, object around, okay. okay? So I know if the dog has an object, if I approach them, they'll turn on, they're gonna guard it. Right? But if that object is gone or the dog is away from the object, the dog would be off. They're not going to guard it because there's nothing to guard. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when your dog is on leash, right, he would be on, you know he's going to be reactive. But the moment you remove that leash, you know that he's going to be off. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. Um, he has done some resource guarding as well at times. Okay. Yeah. He doesn't do it with us anymore. And that was also like right when he got back from training, he, he was he did a couple times where like he would growl at us if we wanted to take something away from him. Mm -hmm. 
he doesn't anymore. I can take anything I want. From okay. Him and it's, it's is no resource issue. guarding, I know you haven't seen it in a while, but is that something you'd want to address we, just in case? Uh, just in case. Sure. Because yeah. it, just because he did have that, I think now I think because he was... trusts us, there's no worry. But okay. if it was someone else, then he might. Yes. Yeah. So that's different though. Yeah. So like I, I have a pit in Chihuahua. I could take what I want from them, but I bet if you tried, they would guard it. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because they don't know or trust you. Right. Okay. Uh, same thing for my girlfriend in the beginning. She couldn't take anything from them. Now she can take whatever because they know and trust her. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's, it's normal behavior. Uh, it's just not appropriate because if you were to bite that person, it's seen as a bite. There is no rationale behind it. Right? Whereas I would say like, well, why did they go to grab the bone while he had it? They're like, right. that's not his, they're not the sucker dog. Right? Yeah. Um, and I get clients all the time where they're like, hey, Jesse, like, you know, my dog's human aggressive. And I go, what did, what happened? Oh, my dog was eating and I put my hand in the bowl. My dog bit me. And I'm, they're like, I'm like, why would you do that? They're like, because I should be able to do whatever I want. And I'm like, that's not how that works. I'm like, do you want someone's hand in your food when you're eating? You know? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, then it's the same thing for your dog. Yeah. So there's, there's some things there. But I agree, like, we have to address it um, just in case. And it's easy to do. It just takes a long time sure. to get enough reps in. Uh, that would we could cover within the 12 classes okay. right now Remember the variables are behavior. Okay, so for whatever reason if we're if we're struggling with the reactivity or the resource guarding which I doubt um, Let's say it takes four classes to address the reactivity, right? Well, that only leaves us like if we're, and we already did the two classes of heal six classes to get stuff done mm -hmm. Does that make sense for the obedience stuff? Yeah. You'll still come a very long way I've not had a person do 12 classes and not be happy Okay, okay? But sometimes once we're so focused on the behavior, we don't get all the control. But as long as you have those three, walk with me, come to me, and don't move, yeah. it still allows you a ton of freedom, yeah. okay? Yeah. So, um, other questions? No. no. Um, another thing, uh, it may not be no, uh, you may not notice it on our, on our YouTube channel right now, but we actually record everything, okay. okay? So everything used to be publicly available. So that people could watch it and go like, oh shit, like Jesse's methods work. Yeah. And like he's at Oz Park and it's fucking working, right? Yeah. But we caught the attention of some TikToker who wanted to talk a lot of crap. So their followers started leaving us like one star reviews and like it was stupid. Yeah, I know. So it's like, really like you watch the video, you disagree with what I do and you're gonna leave me a review and like we can't do anything about it. So, so what we've done now is we, we've made them unlisted. Sure. We still record everything. Okay. I have a website that I had created for my clients where everything is gonna be publicly available to my clients. Okay. Okay, so you would get the links to your videos and stuff. So this way, if it's you ever forgot anything, you can always just go back and watch your own video okay. and uh, get a refresher there. Okay. okay. Uh, Cause we had clients like, you know, what happened that one class? Yeah. <laughs> like, here's the link, just watch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's all available to you. And then like, if I have another client, let's say you're struggling with something, and I had another client and we worked on it and we had great success, I'd send you that video so you can see like, oh, that's what we're trying to, that's what it's supposed to look like. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So it was meant to be a library for people. Yeah. And it, you know, we had people email us like, hey, we watched your videos and we did training, you know, like I had somebody from Australia, someone from Europe, like email us. They're like, hey, your videos helped us. I'm like, awesome, like that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. But it was obviously the back end of it. Yeah. So, um, but otherwise, I don't foresee this being a difficult case. Um, now, if you're wanting to push sociability, yeah. right, like getting them to open up with people, um, I would have to press him, which is I make contact with him, right? So like, let's say I approach you and he starts lunging and barking at me, right? I have to see like, well, do you mean it or are you just bluffing? And the only way to determine that is to actually make contact with the dog because that's the worst thing that could happen to him, okay? okay? Now, I have a suit that protects me. I also have sleeves. It's uh, like with the protection training, the canine suits, right? So we can go and put the dog under all that pressure to see what do they do. So a lot of times we touch the dog, the dog shuts up, okay? And other times the dog becomes offensive a little bit, sometimes a lot of it, okay? But at least the owner knows like, okay, my dog is serious, right? So then we can address it to teach the dog to not bite so that the dog will hold, right? But the owner just wouldn't push it. Does that make sense? It's, it's so to give you an example, I had a client um, whose dog didn't like having her tail touched with anybody, even the owners, okay? And it took me two to three classes uh, to correct that problem to the point where the, the owner actually yelled at me, okay? Because he was like, dude, because it looked like she was getting worse, okay? Aww. But I was like, trust me, right? So we did that. They finished the program, made great progress. Fast forward, they took the dog to Pilsen Fest and a kid, and they had their dog with them because she had been doing so well. A kid ran up and grabbed her tail, okay? And they're like, they saw, like everybody just froze and they saw her, the dog just kind of like, what the hell just happened? And the kid let go and ran away. 
like a kid, right? Nothing happened, right? And I ran into him at a bar, and he told me this, and he bought me a lot of shots. I said, thank you. Because <laughs> we lived in the same neighborhood. We lived, both lived in Pilsen. Uh, but I told him, you know, he's like, I'm really sorry that I yelled at you. He's like, but, you know, he's like, you understand, you know, it's like my dog and this and that. It's my, that's my kid. I was like, I got you, dude. I was like, but I did it. That's why I did it. And I was like, just don't let it happen again, <laughs> right? It's a fail safe. We hope that doesn't happen. Because yeah. I've had, uh, I had another client who lived in the South Loop. Uh, he only did a shorter program, very human aggressive dog. Got the reactivity in check. All that stuff could walk his dog, no problem. Was standing at a light like this, right? And someone came over and just pet his dog from behind. Oh. His dog bit the person, oh, okay? Geez. And then it became this whole thing because the person's like, what the fuck's wrong with your dog? Your dog bit me, this and that. And the guy's like, if you would have asked me, I would have told you, don't pet my dog. It doesn't like yeah. people, right? Yeah. And then, you know, he called me up and he's like, hey, Jesse, this happened. What do you think? I'm like, well, it's not your fault. It's not the dog's fault, yeah. right? I'm like, you're facing one way. The person came behind and pet your dog like that. Yeah. Like, yeah, your dog's human aggressive, but at the same time, you startled your dog. Right. You know, like if someone just came up and grabbed me by the shoulder, I'd be like, what the hell too? Yeah. You know, so crap like that. So we do as much as possible so that um, if you're in that situation, Frank will hold and not respond. Uh, but I always tell people, we're doing it as a buffer just in case, yeah. but then you would avoid it. The people that come to your home, your friends, your family, we have exercises so that he can open up his social bubble. Uh, the barking that initially happens when they knock and all that stuff, yeah. we, we deal with that all the time. That's not an issue, we can address that. Okay. Um, and it's really just rinse and repeat and time to, to work through all these things, okay? okay? Uh, any other questions? No, I think we're just excited to get started. Yeah. So with the booking stuff, Maria, hand, Maria handles all that. Okay. okay. Um, the easiest, um, or if you want to kind of expedite a little bit, if you email her and say, hey, Maria, we're good to go. We want six, nine, or 12, right? Here's our schedule okay. uh, or availability. Uh, send us what we need, right? Because she'd send you a contract. She'd send you the caller that uh, we would recommend for you to pick up. Okay. Um, but if you send her your schedule and availability, it eliminates a step. Because that's what she would ask you for. Sure. Okay. And she cross-references with my calendar. Yeah. And then she's like, okay, these are the spots that Jesse has available that will work for everybody. You yeah. pick what, what you like. If you're doing 12 classes, let's say Saturday at 1030 was open. Yeah. And you did 12. For 12 classes plus one or 12 weeks plus one, that is your time. No one can take it. So for 13 weeks, Saturday at 1030 is your time. Okay. okay. I see you once a week. Yeah. Let's say you cancel, reschedule a few times, and we were to hit the 13th week and you had two classes left over, you don't lose the classes, but okay. you would lose the time, right? Because Maria's got to book someone else right. after you guys to keep my calendar rolling, okay? okay? So then she'd just reach out and say, hey guys, you know, we got those last two classes. Uh, of course, I said earlier, once we hit class nine or so, I most likely have you space them out. So at that point, it may not apply anymore. But if you're keeping to that one uh, once a week routine, yep. that's how that plays out, okay? okay. Uh, if you uh, cancel outside of 48 hours, there, you don't lose the class or what have you. We give everybody a, a last minute within 48 hour a freebie cancellation because we understand things happen. Okay. If you cancel within five hours, it just counts as a class, okay? Because okay. Maria can't do anything with my calendar. And I've had it where I was here and if someone cancels and I'm just here for an hour with nothing to do, right. okay? So, uh, but yeah, if you cancel outside of 48 hours, not a problem. Uh, if you cancel within, we get one freebie. If you cancel within five, it does count as a class, okay? Um, let me think here. Uh, I can only take you as far as you're willing to go. I just had a client that I removed off my calendar after first class because they're in the consultation. I was literally just arguing with them. <laughs> and the first class, I'm surprised they signed up. They showed up. I was like, okay. I'm like, well, let's see what happens, right? And everything was going fine, but their dog was very resilient to the caller. This was also a dog that would not allow people to enter the home, okay? okay. I only had six classes with them. So I'm pushing and pushing and pushing. The dog yelps a couple of times. So then they're like, oh my God, right? I'm like, it's okay. We got to keep going forward, right? They're like, why? The dog's yelping, right? And I'm like, well, if we're trying to address this behavior of your dog going after people when they enter the home right. and we have to correct that, your dog's probably going to yelp there too. And if we don't get this done, this is like the, pri this is what primes everything, right? Yeah. So I only have a limited time. So it was a, another kind of argument back and forth. So I said, you know what, guys? I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to just remove you off the calendar because uh, I have people that want to actually be on the calendar yeah. and do the work, okay? So um, I can only... We, we have no Sure. And it's it's rare. It just it just so happened that we had a very soft owner with a very physically tough dog, oh, you know. Good combo. Yes. So which happens? But I was just like, it, it was, and it happens more like, it's not uncommon. But in this particular case, it was just like literally half an hour of arguing, oh and I was God. like, you guys just wasted your time, you know. And and they paid like two hundred something bucks yeah. an hour with me, right? Yeah. Like, why are we gonna argue? So I was like, 
nah. Uh, but yeah, so everything is logical. Very, it's very much just common sense driven. As long as you got good common sense, we'll make great progress. Uh, we always start low, work our way up, so that this way if we do end up hitting those higher numbers, you understand why. Because everything lower didn't work, okay? okay? Um, last thing would be, people always ask, hey, when does the e-collar go away? Yeah. In my book, when you need it, it doesn't. So that means if your dogs are gonna be off leash, if you're ever walking your dog on a leash, or like let's say you're going somewhere and you know he may be reactive and stuff, yeah. we would wanna have that collar on, okay? okay? So you're not always having to use it, it's just present in case something happens, yeah. okay? If you're always using the collar, you did not follow through with the training very well, okay? It's so like my guys, they're 12 years old, they've been off these trains for about 10 years, they still wear their collars, if I know they're gonna be off leash, okay? Collar, the remote's on my hip, and unless something happens, I really don't need to touch it, okay? So it's like, if a squirrel ran by, and my pit decided to take off and was running towards the street, I would have to step in right there, okay? But other than that, it's just really like as needed. Uh, people always ask, well, why? If the training is so good, why do I need the collar after the training? Easiest way to explain it would be, do you guys drive? Do you go on the expressway? Do you go the speed limit? Most people don't, right? I don't, we get stuck behind someone who does, you get mad at them, right? You speed around them. So that's called opportunistic behavior, okay? So if you see a squad car, what happens? Slow down. You, you pass the squad car, what happens? Speed up, right? because there's threat, yeah. right? Threat of consequence. So that's opportunistic behavior. All animals have is part of survival instincts, okay? So when that collar is on, think of it as a cop on a collar. Your dog's gonna be on his best behavior, okay? okay. He's gonna know the rules. He's gonna go, okay, you have threat of consequence. Okay, I'm gonna behave myself, right? You remove the collar, you're walking him on the leash. He's most likely gonna decide, you know what? I can be reactive right now because I know that cop is not here. Yeah. And you're gonna see that behavior, okay? So it has nothing to do with the training methods. It's just simply opportunistic behavior. If we can get away with it, why not? Right. So. Uh, but you shouldn't have to always be using it. It's simply just there. Yeah. Um, once you like come to a point in your training where it's like, yeah, we have the collar and we haven't touched it in like, you know, two months or whatever. I go, great. That's that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the collars last a really long time. Uh, I would recommend for you the Dr. Black edition. It's meant for a 70 pound dog and over. Okay. So the reason why I suggest that is because since your dog is a bigger dog with a thicker coat of fur, you want to make sure you have enough output to cut through all that stuff. Okay. So the I'd black, the black edition. I just want to write this down. Correct, black edition, and Maria will send you the information as well. Okay. Um, you get more from less. So if you got a lower powered collar like the 1900, right? Yeah. You may find when we're dealing with the behavior, his number jumps up to like 70. Okay. okay? To cut through all the reactivity, but on the black edition, his number might be 20 to 30 because it's more output. So you're getting more from less, which allows us a greater window. So like if you ever get put under a lot of stress, we have the ability to cut through it because we still have 80 to 90 levels to work with. Yeah. Okay? Um, and Marie will send you the information for that. We sell them, you can get them on Amazon. I don't care where you get them. I just care that you get the correct collar. Okay. If you do get them through Amazon, please double check the model because you know you have the 1900S? Yeah. Well, the black edition is also a 1900S. Oh. Okay, so what has happened to a few clients is, Amazon doesn't know this. Yeah. They ship out the wrong collar, they ship out your collar, and my client shows up with a 120 pound rat rattler and the e-collar meant for a 35 pound dog, and I go, we can't do anything today because that is the incorrect model, okay? So double check that it is the black edition if you get it from any kind of online retailer, okay? okay? Um, any other questions or concerns? No. Okay. So you can contact Maria, okay. um, uh, otherwise she'll contact you. And then if you have any questions that you may have forgotten to ask, feel free to ask her. If they uh, have anything to do with me, okay. she'll email me and I'll email and answer back. And so every class will be here at Oz? Yes, start. aside from, uh, so you guys are in the suburb, right? We are. Okay, so the, the in-home will be a little tricky. Okay. Uh, we'll figure something out. Sure. Um, because going to Glenview, Glenview? Yep. Uh, is, is, is a bays away from where I'm at typically. Okay. Uh, so it may be with, uh, my employee, my other trainer here, Enrique. Okay. Um, or I have a video where we did it in home, and then I send it to the client. And a few times, it's they just watch the video and they did it themselves, and everything was fine. Okay. So there's a lot of options there. We'll see. We'll figure it out. Uh, otherwise, you can email Maria. She'll get everything taken care of. And if you have any other questions, just let us know. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Well, guys, it was a pleasure meeting you. Pleasure Thank meeting you. you so any other much. questions? Let us know. And then, uh, if you want to watch Birdie's video, yeah, Birdie. that's just like your dog here. Okay. Okay. You want so. To it's good protein. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Come on, buddy.